Hello, Bio 110. This lecture will introduce you to the kingdom fungi. There won't be enough time in lecture to cover this kingdom, so this presentation, plus the laboratory demonstrations you'll be seeing the week after Thanksgiving, will provide the material you need to know about this important kingdom of life. When you see mushrooms growing, you may not realize that most of the body of the fungus is not visible. It's hidden in the substrate the ground, the rotting log, the piece of fruit that the fungus is growing on. This underground organism can be huge. In fact, the biggest living organism on Earth is a honey mushroom growing underground in the Blue Mountains in Oregon. This hidden fungal body is made up of thread-like filaments called hyphae, each with a diameter of only 2 to 10 micrometers in diameter. These filaments are made up of cells with haploid nuclei, and the cell walls are made of chitin. These chitinous cell walls are one piece of evidence that fungi are more closely related to animals than to plants. The thread-like hyphae are able to lengthen at a very fast rate to enable the fungus to spread rapidly within its substrate. There are also some fungi which have a different growth form, and these are the single-celled forms usually referred to as yeasts. These thread-like hyphae form a network called a mycelium. When you poke through a rotting log in the woods and you see the fuzzy white material, that's the fungal mycelium. Here's another view of a fungal mycelium. In this case, the substrate that this particular fungus is growing on is strawberries and the mycelium undoubtedly permeates into the fruit. What we often refer to as mold is usually a fungal mycelium. The structure of the mycelium is very important to the way fungi ingest nutrients. Fungi are heterotrophs, like animals, but fungi digest their food outside of their bodies and then absorb the organic products. They accomplish this by excreting enzymes, which break down the organic material around the mycelium into organic molecules that can be directly absorbed into the body of the fungus. Fungi are critical in many ecological processes, and one of the most important is decomposition. By infiltrating and breaking down the dead bodies of plants and animals, Fungi are critical in recycling nutrients. The sprouting mushrooms on this fallen tree are evidence that the trunk is riddled with decomposing fungi that will eventually return all the organic molecules back into the nutrient cycle. The tomato will also decompose at a much faster rate than it would without the fungus. Another critical ecological impact of fungi is the formation of mycorrhizae, the mycelium of the fungus literally wraps itself around the roots of the plant and with its huge surface area is able to provide much more water and minerals to the plant than the plant roots alone could. Corn, carrots, tomatoes, apples, onions, coffee, and most of our other fruits and vegetables depend on this relationship between the plant roots and the fungal mycelium for successful growth. The fungus benefits also through access to sugars produced by the plant. Fungi also provide food for many animals, including humans. Mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi, and they play an important role in the diet of both humans and other animals. And of course, you know you should never eat a mushroom you find. Many are deadly. The blue-green veins in this image of cheese are actually the mycelia of special fungi that are placed very deliberately into the cheese as it's being made to add flavor. And of course remember mycorrhizae, without that relationship many of our food plants would not grow well at all. Some fungi are parasitic and have had some profound impacts. A fungus that infects rye grass, if eaten, for example, ground up into flour, can cause hallucinations and death. 
There's some speculation that some people accused of being witches during the Salem witch trials in Massachusetts in the 17th century were actually caused by ingestion of this fungus. There are some fungi which have had a devastating impact on three notable North American trees. The American chestnut used to be the dominant tree of the eastern forests of the U.S., but the huge trees of many years ago are all but gone. The fungus destroys all the above ground parts of the tree. Roots survive and can re-sprout, so we do see this tree growing as a shrub. And Penn State and the State University of New York have developed a strain of this tree that appears to be resistant to the fungus. Elm trees and butternuts have also been devastated by fungal infections. Fungal spores are everywhere and mainly do not cause harm to animals. But there are some fungi that live on the skin and mucous membranes and normally don't cause harm, but some species, under some circumstances, can become a health issue. Let's return to the beneficial impacts of fungi. Our modern antibiotics began with the discovery of a substance produced by a genus of fungus called penicillium. Species in this genus grow on a variety of foods, and not one of us has not benefited from their powerful healing properties. And the action of a species of yeast remember that's a form of fungi that grows as single cells rather than thread-like hyphae, cause the reactions that make bread rise and beer brew. Currently there are five phyla of fungi that are recognized and 100,000 identified species, but there are probably many more not yet identified. In lab we're going to only look at three phyla, the zygomycetes, the ascomycetes, and the basidiomycetes. Now we're going to talk about the life cycle of fungi. And many fungi can reproduce asexually. A single individual can give rise to new individuals without the fusion of sperm and egg. In this generalized diagram, specialized hyphae will produce special cells called spores which are released into the air. If the spores land on a suitable substrate, they can grow into a new individual fungus, which will be genetically identical to the parent. Remember, the nuclei in all the cells in this asexual life cycle are haploid, and only mitosis is needed to produce the spores and the new organism. Before we talk about the sexual life cycles of fungi, I want to remind you about this diagram that you've certainly seen before. It shows the different types of sexual life cycles found in animals, plants, and fungi. Notice that in all three of these life cycles, there is an alternation of a diploid and a haploid form. The process of meiosis, which reduces the chromosome number from diploid to haploid, alternates with the process of fertilization, where two haploid cells join to form a single diploid cell, the zygote. In lab, we'll examine the sexual life cycles of the three phyla of fungi already mentioned. Understanding these general life cycles will be important and helpful as we add the specific details for the phyla that we'll be looking at in lab. And this will be true when we get to the plant labs as well. The sexual life cycles of fungi are complicated and contain lots of terminology you've not heard before. Expect to spend some time with this generalized sexual life cycle diagram. The processes and structures here are critical to your understanding of fungal life cycles. If we begin in the top left of this diagram, note that we see two hyphae from genetically different individuals, indicated by that plus and minus sign. These different individual hyphae come together and then a process called plasmogamy occurs. This literally means the marriage of cytoplasm. The cytoplasm joins into one cell but the two different nuclei do not join. Note that in the resulting hyphae 
you see two distinct and genetically different nuclei, the plus and minus, coexisting inside the same cellular space. This cell is described as dikaryotic or heterokaryotic because it contains two different kinds of nuclei. Think about how this is different than a diploid cell, which has two sets of chromosomes within the same nucleus. These dikaryotic hyphae can grow and divide to form a fruiting body. The most familiar fruiting bodies are mushrooms. Eventually, the dikaryotic cells will undergo the process of karyogamy, literally meaning the marriage of nuclei, and this will finally result in a single diploid nucleus. This diploid nucleus immediately undergoes meiosis to form haploid nuclei, which will be enclosed by cell walls and released as spores. Two very important points to note here are that these spores, unlike the ones formed in the asexual life cycle, are genetically different than either parent, and typically there is a huge surface area over which these processes happen, resulting in the production of huge numbers of spores. Here are some images of different types of fruiting bodies of fungi. They look very different, but each of these fruiting bodies is designed to maximize spore production and dispersal. We'll be looking at fruiting bodies much more closely in lab and seeing many examples. This short lecture was just highlighting some of the most important points that you need to know about the kingdom fungi. Remember, you also have access to lots more information in your textbook, and the handouts you'll be getting in lab this week also give you much more information. Note that in ANGEL, you'll see a fungi and plant lab folder. There is a document in there called Overview and Instructions. Please read that first. It tells you for each of these last two weeks of lab what you need to know and what you need to do. The handouts and life cycle images are also available in ANGEL. You don't need to print these. They'll be available for you in lab. And note that each week the lab handout includes a study guide at the end. This is important because this is material that will be included on your last lecture exam.